Retro Hangover is supported via Patreon by listeners like you. We would especially like to thank our 16-bit tier subscribers, Lyle McCarns and Ashton Ruby. Your continued engagement and generous donations are deeply appreciated. Thank you. Open your ears and crack some beers. You are listening to episode 61 of Retro Hangover. Retroing classic gamers, welcome to the podcast where we are want to wander wantingly, wishing wanton warring weaponized wang waffles. This is episode 61 of the Retro Hangover Podcast. I am your co-host, Chris Copleen, and as always, your host, Shane Swarm of Dick Dragon Loco! Koski. I, <laughs> you know, usually I have some sort of like witty quip or something to follow up your your alliteration with, and I just I, I have nothing. I have nothing this time around. Although mm. weaponized Wang waffles is that's that's on point. Yes, I think that's one of your better ones. They're the I I think I had some help with that one. I have a feeling that uh, I don't know. There were some about. assistance. Uh. <laughs> the people don't need to know that, Chris. I'm not. No, no, what? Don't peek behind the curtain. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Maintain kayfabe. Got it. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so what's up, Chris? What, what do you, what have you been up to in this, this new world that we live in, in the, the, the mm. social distancing? Well, I saw and all that. I saw several dead people outside my house crawling. They were hungry and starving, and they were dying. And uh, part of their face had melted off due to the pandemic, and. Really? I, I thought to myself, this is why they tell you to stay at home, as there were craters of molten lava coming up through the ground, and there was violent eruptions here in Orange Park, and just, it was so sad. Houses were on fire, cats were having sex with dogs, and they were in the dominant position. Uh, there was My just, God. like, devil people running running all over the place, and they were throwing toilet paper, and it was just absolutely frightening. I knew I felt better because I had no flesh wipes. So I banished them with the power of no flesh wipes. Shame. Or flesh wipes. You don't want to no flesh. No flesh would be bad. That would be nasty. So flushable wipes. <laughs> well, also, depend. you know, depending on your situation, um, flushable wipes are also really not actually flushable. I, f- I feel like that's a oddly little known fact that I keeps a lot of plumbers employed. That's I am here to help the economy. <laughs> you are a job creator. <laughs> I am a job creator. I don't even have to make millions of dollars to do it. But if you want to give me millions of dollars to do it, I will. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't complain. Well, I mean, uh, I guess, <laughs> you know, my 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 experience so far has been vastly different. So I guess oh. maybe this is the one time where I'm glad that I live in the middle of nowhere. It sound It sounds like civilization is... Mm is breaking down in a very uh, Doom 2 sort of way. It's okay, Shane. If you wear a mask, everything will be fine. Yeah, that's that's what I've heard. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, gloves. But, you know, mm-hmm. just don't then go on to touch literally everything with the same pair of gloves because that kind of defeats the purpose. No glove, no love. That's right. That's right. Zero love. That takes takes on a, a completely different meaning today, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but in reality... Uh, I have just yes. I, I have been pretty much sitting around doing nothing. Everything's closed at the current moment because at the current moment we are going through a health crisis of a worldwide proportion. So everything is just kind of on lockdown. Um, mm-hmm. So that's that's what I've been up to. So I've been playing a lot of games and trying to work from home and like working from home is great because I've never really had much work to begin with in my current situation. So um, I did finish as your dreams. Uh, got a rapid fire review ready for it. Uh, wasn't a really good core gameplay mechanic if you like roguelikes, but everything else just feels really superfluous uh, in comparison to what the main game is. 
So it's it's really hard to recommend unless you really like tower roguelike kind of games. But that rapid fire review will be out for our patrons at the 60 bit tier uh, eventually as as it gets to the rotation. And That's right. uh, also, I have started playing Fantasy Star, which I'm pretty sure that Shane will be talking about a little bit here. I think we have some plans for that. It sounds I b- like I believe we do. Yes, some plans. We, we might be doing something with that. We don't know when, but I think that will be in order because I think we're both enjoying it. Or at least you enjoyed it, but I'll let you talk about that. Um, and as soon as that done, I, that's done. It like I got spoiled because I won a contest from our local barcade uh, leaderboard and uh, someone who's very closely affiliated with them. His name is Steve Rosa, also active in the video game community around here, and happened to win a copy of Final Fantasy VII Remake. So I was going to go from Fantasy Star into the game Near for the Xbox 360 because that game has been calling me for quite some time. But I'll have to put that off and move over to Final Fantasy VII. And I'm not talking about Dark Souls. <laughs> okay, you, you want to you save that for a different time? Um, if, if you want to know my experience about Dark Souls, it was on our, what, what was it called? Um, Sunday Streams. I can't even remember uh, because it's yeah. just Lyle and Solemn. So thank you both of you uh, <laughs> for being there. Uh, I'm not talking about Dark Souls for a while. I'm going to make make sure my mind is quite wrapped around it before I go off on it or appraise it. I'm not sure. It's not like the sun, I don't think. All right. Well, I mean, that's fair. I mean, eventually, you you know, you'll you'll come around to it and you will learn to praise the sun and wish that you were as grossly incandescent just as I do. We'll find that out. So how about you, Shane? How have you been dealing with this quarantine and how has it affected your video game habitat? Um, well, so the whole quarantine thing, honestly, I mean, the, the, right, the, the memes have been flying around for a little while now about like, oh, well, this, this is the introvert's time to shine. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah, kind of. I mean, I, it's, it's not really changing too much for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I, um, I, I wouldn't say that like my game time has increased at, at all, really. I think it's about the same. Although I, I feel like I have been diving into some games that I might not have otherwise. And so you you kind of touched on that already. But um, I, I started playing Fantasy Star. Um, I picked up the Sega Ages version for the Switch because a lot of that uh, Sega Ages stuff is actually on sale right now on the eShop. It's always on sale, too. It, well, okay. But I saw that it was still on sale, and so I think I ended up picking up for like I don't know five bucks or something like that. And um, man, I just got totally engrossed in that game. And I even you know for <laughs> for someone who who runs a, a retro video game podcast, I um I don't always get really grabbed by a lot of those older titles like that. Like I'll put some time into them just for posterity or whatever, but it, they don't necessarily suck me in as one might expect but for whatever reason fantasy star just totally did that and um i was telling chris a little while back that i started playing at about 10 o'clock one evening and then suddenly realized it was about two in the morning um and that doesn't happen often these days especially with a master system rpg of all things Uh so um ultimately i ended up finishing it uh, I kind of blazed through a lot of that that game actually, and to be fair, the the Sega Ages sort of easier difficulty kind of helped with that. I'm mm-hmm. not gonna lie, um, that game is grindy as shit. But uh, I don't want to go too much further into that because, as as Chris alluded to, um, there's a very real possibility that we may end up doing an episode on that game um, sometime in the future. So keep an eye out for that. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Outside of that, um, I finished up Fantasy Star. Um, I actually started Final Fantasy One, um, the PlayStation Origins version. Ooh. And uh, yeah, and um, is that the one where they still have? I don't know if it's an option that I know in the GBA version they 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 gave mm-hmm. them magic points as opposed to like the D and D use per level system. So is Origin still has the, the how many uses of a spell you can have per level, right? That's right. Yeah. The Origins version still keeps that like D&D style like spells per day mechanic. Yeah. Mm. Did you know that game's actually a port? I think I recall hearing that. I don't remember what the port was from, but the Wonder Swan Color. Mm. If And if you don't know what that is, it's very obscure. It's an obscure portable from Japan. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. I think we actually have somebody I want to say I think it's on Instagram. There's like there's a Wonder Swan account that follows us. So. 
<laughs> there, there are fans out there for sure. God, that means I have to get more um, games and take more pictures. God damn it. Yeah. Yeah. But started that. I haven't put a whole lot of time into it yet because I got, like I said, I got engrossed in fantasy star, but I've, I've started that one. And, um, I actually circled back to final fantasy 13. Finally, after getting freaking cock blocked on the Odin Eidolon fight and, uh, took a slightly different approach to it and ended up one shotting it. So apparently the old adage of you should just take some time away from something and come back to it, um, still holds up. So, so I can now I'm free to progress in final fantasy 13 again. So I'll probably be doing that. I think that's my next big thing. And again, that's not a, not, not a bad game. I think it gets way more hate than people give it. Yeah. So yeah, man, that's, uh, that's pretty much what I've been up to lately. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I just want to say, yes, um, I am redeemed because the fu- okay. Resident Evil four people are thinking it's going to get a remake. And instead uh-huh. of everyone screaming at the top of their lungs that it has to be remade, that we really want to relive our nostalgia and we want to see everything how we imagined it. And this is what we we need. And if if Square Enix doesn't do this for us, I mean, Capcom doesn't do this for us. It's going to be ter- no, they're like, please don't remake this. It holds up. <laughs> yeah i just think that needs yep. to be said um what what's the difference i don't know you answer that question for yourself why is that one game people are like yeah we really don't know if this game gets needs to get remade and the other and there's another game uh more popular at the moment that we have already mentioned that people were screaming to get remade for um since 2006 and said that it had to happen and if squared into it they were a bunch of soulless bastards i don't know you answer that question yourself <laughs> Oh, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm happy for you that you feel vindicated. Not just vindicated, validated, 100% validated. Okay. And, well, there you and, go. and the reactions to, to what happened is happening with the Final Fantasy VII remake, uh, especially on some of our Instagram, on one of our Instagram photos, but around the internet in general, I don't know. It like it's giving me a, a very small piece of pleasure that I'm just relishing on. I'm, I'm actually relishing on the, the backlash and the controversy and I'm loving it. I, I, I believe that is what the Germans refer to as Schadenfreude. Yeah, whatever. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Scheiser. Reveling in the misery of others. Yes. Scheiser Freuder. I got it. Yep. That's the one. So yes, a lot of Schadenfreude. I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so, uh, so Chris, what are, uh, what, what are we, what are we talking about today? <laughs> what, what is our, our game du jour? Uh, the game du jour, uh, is not yes. Robert, uh, Mandu. It is oh. Gears mm. of War. And if you're wondering why I said ah. Robert Mandu, uh, well, you should watch your Sunday streams. But we are talking about Gears of War, the legendary, the amazing, the prolific, fantastic game for the Xbox 360. I, I, I'm being a little hyperbolic. Am I? Maybe. For some people. Ah, uh, yes. The the cogs of battle. The cogs of conflict, because wars are never declared in this in this current universe. But mm. in any case, uh, let's get this episode rolling. We've been bullshitting too long. So I think today is very appropriate, since this is a, a Microsoft game and it's really spent a lot of time on PC, that we give it to our PC master racer, Shane. So, Shane, why don't you yes. give us a brief history of Gears of War? Halo 3 is still a year away. The rare titles are underwhelming at best. Nothing is quite screaming next gen, at least not yet. The PS3 is right around the corner, and the PS2 is holding its position as the definitive gaming experience, despite its growing age. But this time, if you're Microsoft, you've got a lead. People are buying your system faster than the previous iteration, and you've got a secret weapon. A muscle-bound, high-definition, do-ragged, buff-boy secret weapon. You've got Gears of War. And it is beautiful. In 2006, the next generation of consoles was just kicking off. 
The Xbox 360 had been out for about a year, and while it was impressive, nothing was making it a must-have outside of just being the first on the block with the ability to display HD graphics, something that wasn't standard or even commonplace yet. The most impressive thing the 360 had to boast was the vastly improved Xbox Live service, making multiplayer a simple and enjoyable experience. But there needed to be games. So Microsoft got developer Epic Games, with lead designer Cliff Blazinski, to make them a new exclusive. But that's not actually where the Gears story truly begins. Around the year 2000, the game had started development under the moniker Unreal Warfare. At the time, the game was intended to be an arena-based shooter, much like a certain tournament series with a very similar name. Epic ultimately put the game on ice, however, as they chose instead to focus on their aforementioned main attraction. When Epic returned to Warfare, they found that the industry had largely shifted back to single-player games. Not wanting to be late to the party, they decided to capitalize on the trend. During the design phase, Blazinski looked to other sources for inspiration. Gears would end up borrowing facets of gameplay from Resident Evil 4, Killswitch, a PS2 game from Namco Bandai, and Bionic Commando. The game takes its third-person over-the-shoulder perspective from RE4, the tactical cover mechanic from Killswitch, and the ability to swing from one location to another from Bionic Commando. By combining these staple elements, Gears would go on to define what would become a wildly successful subgenre, the cover shooter. For years to come, other games would attempt to ape this run-hide-shoot formula to varying degrees of success. At the 2005 Game Developers Conference, or GDC, Epic would show a demo of Gears as an unnamed Xbox 360 exclusive, though this was primarily to promote Unreal Engine 3, as the game was shown to industry folks behind closed doors. The game would eventually release on November 7th, 2006 to near universal praise, almost unanimously winning the title of Best Xbox 360 Game of 2006, as well as garnering numerous Game of the Year awards. It would, perhaps unsurprisingly, see massive sales numbers, netting 3 million units moved in its first 10 weeks, and ultimately becoming the fastest selling game of 2006, with a cumulative total of 6 million units sold. Undoubtedly, Gears of War set the bar for a new generation of games and established the Xbox 360 as THE force to be reckoned with. It would go on to receive multiple sequels, and continues to be a flagship franchise for Microsoft to this day. And that is your brief history of Gears of War. Alright, thank you very much Shane for providing that brief history. Uh, yeah, I would, I look at Gears of War and how it made me feel it came out and I just looked at the graphics and I thought to myself, this is unreal. (laughs) Ah, this, you know, I said this before, but I got to remember to put a rim shot in post on, on those, but (laughs) go on. Oh man. Uh, so uh, following up your brief history, uh, as we are wont to do, what is your, what was your first experience with, with this game? Yeah, so um, I, I think I've mentioned this on a couple different occasions on previous episodes, but um, I got an Xbox 360 close to the tail end of its life cycle. Um, and so Gears was actually one of the first games I picked up. Uh, actually, I think I bought it along with the 360. I went down to a GameStop and um, got a 360 Slim and a copy of Gears and I believe I want to say a copy of GTA 4 um, and probably one or two other things. Um, but that that was that was my first kind of experience with it because I had already heard for a, a number of years at that point about the Gears of War, well, series. It had, I think it had become a series by that point. And so it was something that I felt like, you know, I was missing out on. And uh, so, so, yeah, I made sure to grab it. And uh, I wasn't disappointed. Um, I hadn't actually played a whole lot of sort of third person cover based shooters uh, in my life up until that point. I think a lot of the shooters I had played were largely FPSs because, as you mentioned, I am in fact a, a member of the the PC master race, as it of were. Of course, yeah. So um, that's all they play too. Yeah, that's you know, it's just it's just Counter Strike. 
all, all day long. <laughs> Counter Strike 1.6, by the way. Don't don't give me any of that new source bullshit. You can get that right the fuck out of my face. And Fortnite. No, fuck off with that. I don't need it's, to it's, build. I don't need to build no fucking stairs in my shooter. Thank you very that's, much. That's Gears of War's epic legacy. I took the stairs that were already there, and we and we liked it. Damn it. <laughs> But uh, uh, but yeah, man, that, that's that's kind of my entry point into the into the the gears of verse, uh, I guess. Um, and I wasn't disappointed. Um, it, it was it was a lot of fun. I have some I have some some nitpicks about it and and some things to say. But uh, before I get to that, um, what about you? How did how did you kind of get into uh, the head of Marcus Phoenix, as it were? So I, I can't remember. If I got this with my 360 or not, but I, I'm pretty certain I got this game right around launch mm. because I remember getting a 360 a little after. I think I've said this before on this podcast as well, a little bit after I returned from a deployment in 2007. Right. So because I, I remember getting Marvel Ultimate Alliance as one of my launch games. Mm. That was actually one of the other ones you just remind me. It was that dual pack of Ultimate Alliance and um, I think Forza or something. Hmm. I didn't anyway. have Forza, so it was – yeah, I mean, I got a little bit earlier than you did, obviously. Right. But, but yeah, one of the games I bought with the 360 was Ultimate Alliance. I can't remember if it was Gears or not. But uh, I did get it very, very, very soon after release just because – one, the ad, ad campaign. Ad campaign was absolutely uh, brilliant, especially for a 21, 22-year-old – a 22-year-old who was uh, extremely into the deepness of Donnie Darko. And how amazing it was. So oh, yeah. when you see the Gears of War campaign, which had uh, the uh, Mad World theme from Donnie Darko in there, I'm already like, oh, Donnie Darko is so awesome. And this song is so awesome. And now they're playing it with this game. So this game is going to be awesome. Not to mention it's just cool in general. Uh, God, I had to get get that game. I had to get the game. You know, I'm just I'm just personally I'm glad to know that I I was not the only one that was just edgy as fuck for a better part of my young life. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, it's we like no I'm not alone. We liked bunny rabbits that were in a movie for no real specific reason. That's right. Like Donnie Darko and Boondock Saints and Fight Club yeah. were like my life for quite a while. <laughs> Fight Fight Club's held up for what it's worth, but Donnie Darko has not. That's one of those movies it's so deep man why eh, it's kind it. of up its own ass yeah <laughs> you you wouldn't but, get it yeah, well, and then you re- look yeah. back and you're like I, I i didn't get it <laughs> <laughs> but it was just like, uh, it was dark and cool dark and cool but anyway um so like yeah uh moving on to like more of what we experienced with it the funny thing is i think what really hit me most about this game and i think really hit b- most people about this game when it came out was how beautiful the game was, like how how the jump from PS2, Xbox to the 360. It mm-hmm. really ushered in that next generation of graphics. And I could say this as someone when I got the when I got the game, I was still playing on a standard definition TV. We had not had an HD TV yet. So mm-hmm. for for those of you younger listeners to this podcast, uh, or those who may not remember, 2006. A lot of people still did not have HD TVs. 2007. A lot of people still did not have HD TVs. Uh, they were uh, they were just starting to make it into everybody's homes. So even on a CRT TV, this game was a cut above what you were getting on the previous generation. I think that really was that driving force to get this game into the homes, and I think it really helped out the 360 as well. Yeah. So just just for clarification's sake, when you say an HD TV, you're not talking exclusively 1080p, right? You're talking like 720 yeah 720p 1080i gotcha okay yeah yeah because like i so i i had a slightly different experience because i came to it a little bit later i had well actually i I still have the damn thing but um i had a 720 plasma tv that i ended up playing this on so i got to experience that a little bit differently right but I think that it only displays in 720p. Yeah, I think you're right. It's not a 1080i. 10, uh, well, 1080i, I think it does, but not, it's not 1080p. Right. It's not true HD. But uh, so you got you got that experience like when you played it. That was you were getting the full money right there. I was, yeah. And I mean, even coming to it later, I mean, you know, and having a, a gaming PC, 
still just it's it was still a beautiful game and that that was of course even before the uh the inevitable you know hd remaster that they did um a number of years later but prior to that uh yeah it, it was still impressive to look at for sure and it's funny too because you you had pointed out in our in our show notes that you know you're talking about how good this game looks and that <laughs> that came at a cost to microsoft for sure um Oh, the, yeah. the, the demo of that game um, actually was the reason that Microsoft ended up uh, being forced to up the amount of RAM that was included in uh, the 360 model because they were going to go with 256 meg at the time. And then when Epic showed them how Gears of War was going to look limited to 256, they were like, shit. All right. Well, I guess <laughs> I guess we have to spend more money on this. And so they bumped it up to 512, which is what the 360 ended up launching with. Um, and just fun fact, turns out that cost uh, Microsoft roughly about a billion dollars, give or take, to actually implement that upgrade. But turns out I think it was so, probably worth it. Brief, brief, brief related tangent here. Sure. How did more people not get fired? Uh, okay, so <laughs> what do you, what for, do you for, the, for the 360. So like upgrading from 256 to, to 512 megabytes cost them about 1 billion. Then you take into the the – account the cost of the red ring of death and how mm. much that that cost fucking microsoft and, and the xbox 360 wasn't it like a loss leader up until like two or three years ago uh yeah yeah it was just like the xbox brand like holy shit no i got it like you're not going you're not going to compete with the ps3 with 250 megabytes of ram you could not do gears of war with 256 megabytes of ram that was not going to happen there was yeah. no way that was going to happen the PS3 would have wiped the floor with Microsoft if that had happened. Let's just be real. Oh, absolutely. And the crazy thing about that, right? I mean, there's there's much more parity now between, you know, your typical console, even a base model, and what, you know, your sort of average gaming computer may or may not be. But back then, even even then, like the idea that they were intending to release a game console with 256 megabytes of memory in an age where having at least a gig was not uncommon in a gaming PC was in retrospect insane. Yeah. So I'm glad they did that. Cause you really had a, you really got a beautiful game and yeah, it's probably oh, that, absolutely. that extra Ram probably helped with facilitating his online components. Ah, that's a nice segue. Uh huh. So, did you play this game a lot on on online when you got it as well? Uh, I have never played this game or any Gears of War game online multiplayer ever. Which apparently, really? yeah, which apparently is I might be in the minority on that one because even though, um, according to Blazinski and Epic, the multiplayer portion of the original Gears was actually largely an afterthought. It actually turned out to be one of the biggest things about the game um i think they gave it such a long tail after its release people enjoyed the hell out of that but i just that's just me man like i don't i don't do a lot of multiplayer gaming so i just never bothered but i i'm assuming you did oh yeah because uh, back then like i was a filthy fucking casual as yeah, i've right. always said uh, the filthy fucking casual playing the hottest games <laughs> even though i never got into call call of uh call of duty i'm, I'm kind of happy about that mm -hmm. but I got my Xbox Live subscription. I wanted to know what all the hype was about because I hadn't played online in a very long time, about seven years by the time I got this game. The time previous to that, I had played on the Dreamcast. That was my online experience prior to. And some brief online experience with PC, but it had, it had been a while. Um, And the co-op campaign, there's definitely a difference between the, the co-op campaign and a single player. I think the co-op campaign is a lot better. I think it's a lot more fun. Mm -hmm. It's just a, it's, it's a, more enjoyable experience. It may have been an after afterthought, but it just works so well together. You know, player two is always Dom. Player one is always Marcus. And uh, just going online for the first time, that was very ex exhilarating as a as someone who hadn't been online, especially for a while. And just playing together a game that you didn't have to PVP. And there was that option, too. And I didn't play that. But you could just link up with any random player, put your headset on. And boom, you're playing an entire campaign with someone you, you didn't even know. And it was completely fluid. And it was amazing. It was a lot of fun. So I'm I'm curious, what was your like personal experience with that as far as just like jumping into trying to do co-op with just some rando on Xbox Live? Because anything I've ever heard 
about XBL has always been, you know, the stereotypical, like, you play with 12-year-olds who talk about fucking your mom. Uh, wasn't as prevalent back then, for me at least. Uh, well, that's I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it didn't happen. Sure. I just, I, maybe I just got lucky. I, every single time I played online co-op, I always seemed to have at least a competent partner. And uh, that's that's good because I, I suck at all sorts of shooters. So I wasn't even that good back then. So they probably viewed me as the 12 year old, especially, you know, I was, I was still young then myself, a 22 year old that didn't play a lot of video games mm-hmm. uh, just because of my work. And it's certainly not as much as I play now, even though maybe I was even a little bit better back then. Well, maybe, maybe the co-op aspect of it might bring out a different, a different breed of player than maybe it's more right. like the competitive stuff that kind of brings out the shit lords. Right. Cause I mean, I think the people who want to play co-op are, are just, have a different mindset in general. Yeah. I guess that makes so, sense. Yeah. They're, they're going there for cooperation, not, not to talk to a fucking asshole. So I think <laughs> right. like that, that's, that's kind of the mindset. It's a mutual agreement. Hey, I'm here to have a good time. Don't fuck me. And that's like PVP is the exact opposite of that. You know, fuck you. Here's, here's my balls in your face. And <laughs> you're going to like it when I fucking cover and crouch with my ass all over your face. If you're dead. Ha ha ha. I think that's kind of what would happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Speaking about cover, let's talk about uh, the cover cover mechanic, because that really was very pervasive for that generation of games just in general. Third person shooters were the third person shooters and first person shooters were the game du jour game of that generation. And if it was a third person shooter, you had cover mechanics. So what did you think of that? Yeah, so it was interesting coming to it sort of after the fact a little bit um, because I could see kind of where that whole like trend began, really. I mean, not to say that Gears of War was the first to ever do anything like that. Obviously, in our brief history, you know, we kind of covered that it had some inspiration from some perhaps lesser known previous titles. But uh, the way that it implemented it, specifically the way that it kind of tied all of those mechanics together, created this end result that really did become sort of the, the bar for all games to try to emulate after. I mean, it was the same, it's the same thing as like world of Warcraft, every single MMO for years after wow, tried to be wow. And most of them failed. Um, and I would go out on a limb and say that a similar thing kind of happened with gears where suddenly everybody tried to jump on that latest trend and for better or worse, some of them did it pretty well. And then there were a lot of just garbage cover shooters, but Talking about Gears specifically, I think it does it extremely well. As I had mentioned, I was relatively new to the whole third-person shooter kind of genre. Uh So this was actually kind of fresh for me, even though I was coming to it late. And it it was enjoyable. Like, I think the controls were very fluid. Um, I think the, the mantling over cover and sliding behind, you know, cover walls and shooting over top and all that stuff, um, was very intuitive. Um, I don't recall like ever having much of an issue with that. As I said a little bit earlier, I, I do have some criticisms of of maybe not the mechanic itself, but but the the game as far as how it kind of maybe doesn't do much more with it over the course of the of the of the story campaign. But uh, right, but no, by and large, I, I think it was it was very well done. Oh yeah, uh, it's very like you said, it's very intuitive. It's it's very easy to pick up the controller and play. And this is coming from someone who I did not like shooters at mm-hmm. all. Like I'm still I still don't like shooters, but I can go into Gears of War, like going from cover to cover, being able to dash into cover, being able to jump out of cover. Um, just every sort of mechanic they had in there from reloading your weapon to how do you throw a grenade and where grenades went uh, and how that ori- oriented around cover. That was that was really good. Like Epic Games put a lot of thought into it. And that's definitely the core mechanics. I have no problem with the core mechanics of this game whatsoever. Now, getting onto what you're saying about a lot of those problems, I can definitely see it because the game does, uh, as you put in the notes here, like the game does go on for, for a little bit longer than it probably should. But I can understand why it would back then. I mean, you're paying $60 for a game. This is a flagship showcase game. It's got to be longer than four or five hours. They have to do that. Uh, they, they have to stretch it out a little bit. Sure, sure. Yeah. And, and b- before we completely move on to that, just one final kind of point to 
punctuate what you were just saying about the the mechanic too is that you know it was it was done by Blazinski and the team like very intentionally some of the interviews that they had had with him um around that time and and afterwards you know he made a point of of saying that they really wanted to make sure that they um grounded this game in a little bit more reality so one of the even though they wanted to do a sci-fi shooter there were a couple of things that they purposefully wanted to avoid um one of which was laser guns which you might notice <laughs> you you don't really have a laser gun at all in the game. You have the hammer of dawn, and that yeah. thing's fucking well, badass. <laughs> that's a laser satellite. That's totally different. <laughs> but um, but you don't you don't have any laser guns. Uh, and, and one of the other things is they really really wanted to leverage that cover based tactical shooting, because one of the things that Blazinski had noticed about a lot of sci fi shooters up until this point was that uh, the tactics that players would use were completely unrealistic as far as like, you know, the real world is concerned. Like no one in their right mind is going to circle strafe anybody in a real gunfight. That's just mm-hmm. not going to happen. In a video game, it's a totally valid tactic, or at least it, it was. Um, but they wanted to get away from that. And I do think that they were very successful with that in that way, because that's one of the things that I did like about the system in Gears of War is that it actually makes you think much more tactically about how you're approaching a combat scenario where you actually assess the the area you're in, figure out, you know, where your cover points are and where you can get to in a reasonable amount of time. Um, you know, you, you start thinking about things like laying down cover fire so that, you know, your enemy will go behind a wall just long enough for you to move forward and things like that. Stuff that you wouldn't have thought about uh, in a lot of previous shooters, you know, up until that point. So, um, so I think they did do, yeah, especially well. there there's more a run and gun kind of thing. Like, yeah, going in. absolutely. I mean, it was coming, coming, it was coming out of the era of, of unreal, you know, it was coming out of its lineage where it was just running around shooting and, and keep moving, you know, that doom unreal kind of feel to first person shooters. That that was the name of the game. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, for, for what it's worth, well, we're going to talk about this someday because I have a lot of fondness for Unreal Tournament specifically, but, um, but Unreal Tournament was its own, was its own thing. And that run and gun mm-hmm. style was very much enjoyable in its own right. But I think this did a lot to separate itself from that and, and did it very well. Um, but yeah, so to, to your point about, you know, um, maybe some of the things that detract a little bit from the experience, I, I do feel, and I, I remember thinking this when I first played through the game that honestly, I actually kind of had to force myself to finish it. I, I got to a point, maybe three quarters of the way through the campaign where I was just like, man, this is just more shooting around walls. All right. So we're going to go from one cutscene where we're talking to somebody on the radio to more shooting to more talking on a radio to another place where we just do more shooting. And this is the entire campaign. Okay. I mean, uh-huh. and it's funny too, because actually roughly about three quarters ish way through the game, there is a cutscene where one of your squad mates says something to the effect of just like, Oh shit, we're doing this again. And I was just like, yeah, man, like I feel, I feel you. <laughs> okay. But there, there are some things that do, uh, break up the gameplay and I'm not a fan of all of them. So I, I kind of want to go through those like this. Yeah. Was the game that really introduced before it was overly common. The idea of turret, uh, the, the turret shooting portion where you just get behind a turret and just waylay on, on enemies. I That's think true. that, uh, that was fun when this game came out. It's not so much. It's kind of boring now, but it was, I mean, there's still gratification, but in any case, it's more overplayed now, but that was fun. Uh, the things that I didn't like was those stupid stealth sections where mm-hmm. you had to jump from the light to the dark. <laughs> that's and that's if you funny, cause I actually was going to point that out as one of the things that I thought was at least like an interesting mix up of the formula. I no, I appreciate it, but <sighs> Okay, there's just times and times in there I thought it was kind of bullshit. Overall, it wasn't a bad mechanic. I thought I think they they could have done a better job with it, but you could understand that was kind of a, a secondary thought to them. Like the the core mechanic, like the first game, the first level and shit like that. That's what they wanted to do. Yeah, but you kind of start to feel like that maybe they realized exactly what we're talking about, right? Where they're just like, oh, you're right. Uh, yeah. okay, we need to do something different. I guess what do we do now? Now the part I really didn't like, mm-hmm. and maybe I'll, I'll see what you think about this. Is those um, uh, the armored vehicle sections where you have to shine a light on the locust? Oh, the the krill, yeah, yeah, the krill, yeah. 
Yeah, to shine uh, a light on them in order to keep them off your vehicle. And those, the major reason I didn't like them, I thought those levels went on way too long. Mm-hmm. They they just would not end. Like, those things are fun in short bursts. It was like an entire level, and I just, I could not stand it after after a little bit. No, I, I agree with you. And part of the reason that it feels like it drags so much, in my opinion, is that they you know, purposefully made that such that the, the, um, the junker, the vehicle that you're in can only, mm-hmm. can only has, according to, according to in universe lore, it only has enough power to either power the engine or the UV cannon, but not both at the same time. So every time you start to get overwhelmed with the, the krill, which by the way, are, are totally just ripoffs of their creatures from, um, Chronicles of Riddick, but I digress. Um, you have to stop your vehicle completely so that you can then use the mounted UV cannon to like burn them away and then continue driving. And that's fucking irritating. So no, I'm, I'm totally with you on that. Yeah. And, uh, I think this is where we can talk about how the plot is just non-existent. Hey, all right. Yeah. I d- fuck segues. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, the next thing, <laughs> um, yeah. So, <sighs> I kind of feel like we're shitting a lot on the game, but I mean, th- these are some valid. We're points. nitpicking. We are nitpicking. Yeah. Let's so just be. Story, let's, let's be real. Yeah, the story just kind of sucks. I mean, let's be honest. And, and remember, you have to take this in the context of there only being one Gears of War game because at that time that's all there was, and so mm-hmm. you could look at it now with like Gears Four and whatever other spinoff titles they tried to do, and you get a much more holistic kind of narrative. But at the time, all you got was this game. And all you got in this game was basically fuck all as far as plot is concerned. Like they sort of reference some shit that happened in the past, yeah. but they never really flesh out any of it. And then the game ends on this like cliffhanger of, you know, well, we're going to continue fighting and we must continue fighting and what, and, but, and this is generic coming. cliffhanger one one shit. Right. And you have no context or reason for why. And I don't know if that's supposed to be like enticing in a way or something where you're just like, Oh shit, what does this mean? And I guess it could work for that. But like you, you, you get none of that background and well, I'll, I'll let you talk a little bit about why, because this suffers from the same problem as, um, like the newer Star Wars movies where apparently if you want the full story, you need to look elsewhere. You know what? Uh, I saw the show notes. I don't think that's why the plot suffered. I don't think that's why it suffered at all. And and very briefly before I move on, uh, did you get, did you get the feeling from like the locusts and like the end boss that they were just really ripping off resident evil three and nemesis and uh, maybe even to another point, like Lord of the Rings and the orcs. I just (laughs) really got that feeling. Uh, yeah, I could see like from a, from a creature design perspective, I could totally see some similarities between nemesis and the locust for sure. Yeah. Yeah. In any case, why why the plot sucks? I know just kind of a brief, uh, digression there. I don't know why the plot sucks. And you say like it it sucked because of the, the, the kind of the lore is in the ether. The lore is on the extended universe. Like read the books, read the comics, uh, go out there. That was established. And that was something they established even before the game came out. They knew they wanted the game to be a trilogy. They knew they wanted the game to have an extended universe. They knew they wanted the players or the fans of the series to invest in media other than the game. Now, insofar as why it sucked in game, I don't think that's why. I think just why it sucked in game is, again, look at the shooters leading up to that, like the, the almost the 10 year history of shooters leading up to that. And where they were coming from there that you had your unreals, you had your quakes, you had your dooms, and they kind of had similar lore. The plot was more in the background. It was in the manual. But in terms of real plot, no one really gave a shit like the game didn't really explain it. And that's kind of where Gears, you know, Gears War, I see comes in. They're borrowing plot elements from those games like the game is the game. You just turn off your mind, go shoot shit and deal with it. The reason why I think it's more disappointing in Gears of War, and this is why we're nitpicking, because I don't think it's an expectation of a game from 2006 to really have a cohesive plot. That was really broke on Half-Life and Half-Life 2. I was just going to say, like, Your Honor, I would like to enter Half-Life into evidence, please. Right. But they were the exception, not the rule. And you're talking about the creators of Unreal. They they were trying to move forward, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. It was an attempt. 
So they were trying to adapt to what Half-Life was doing. They just didn't do it well yet. And the reason why it's disappointing in Gears of War is because there is so much there. Like going back to the Mad World commercial, they're trying to establish this this planet. You're wondering what happened here? Why did this happen? What? Why is Marcus Phoenix so angry at the Locust? You never find out. Why is Dom fighting? Why is Coltrane fighting? Why are Why are these people fighting? Like, what's their history? What What's going on with them? Because they seem like interesting characters, and there's reference to what's going on with them, but it's never really explored. And I think that's. I, I mainly think they did that one. Yes, you're right, because there was an extended universe they wanted you to buy and and capital capitalism in, and. But the other part is I don't think they completely understood how to do that in game yet. They they hadn't grasped it yet. Uh, I suppose I I don't know. I kind I feel like I kind of disagree a little bit with that. I just I, I think you might be giving them more leeway than maybe they deserve because and, and granted this is a little bit more of a, a cynical viewpoint on it, but I really do think that a lot of the a lot of the plot critical pieces for the Gears of War universe were almost intentionally withheld specifically because as you had mentioned they they went into this already knowing that they wanted to build this like whole extended universe around the games including tertiary media like novels and comics and all that other shit and so to motivate people to go and buy the books rather than just sticking to playing the games they put a lot of really important shit in those books. Like if you wanted to know anything about like, you know, the discovery of emulsion, which was, you know, the fuel source that, you know, the, the whole world ended up using and, you know, the pendulum war that came about because of it and emergence day and like the lambency sickness, which spoiler is the reason the locust even exists or like Marcus's dad and his discovery of the locust before anybody else and his attempt at trying to like create a peaceful resolution to it, the problem before they decided they needed to take over the surface world. Like you don't know any of that shit, but it's all in those novels. Like you could get all that information from the novels and comics. And I, I, I would be, I'm hesitant to say that it was just a result of them, like not knowing how to really properly tell a story in a game. Cause I, I still think that there was a lot of precedent set for that prior to 2006. Okay. Um, Now do star Wars, a new hope. What about it? What do you mean? It's the same fucking thing. What? Cause you don't know a whole lot of the stuff. Is that what you mean? Exactly. Well, yeah. So, okay. But that's kind of a different issue. There was a reason there was, well, there was a reason for that, too, is because, you know, like, uh, uh, fucking George Lucas didn't know that it was going to be successful. True, true. But I, I think it's also part of a different, like, more general problem of origin stories in a way. Like, you're, you're, you're right. I'm not disagreeing with you. I think A New Hope also suffers from this where you, you get, although I think it does a better job, but um, you, you still – don't know a whole lot about what's going on and you kind of have to take a lot of face value and you don't learn about that until the, you know, subsequent entries into the series. And it's the same issue with, with gears of war. And I, and you can make that argument for a number of other, like, you know, trilogies or series or whatever, where you might not get a lot of that fleshed out, you know, universe and plot and everything until uh-huh. you get further into the series. And I'm not saying that's right. I, I think that by and large, a lot of your your you know foundational plot and things like that should be built in your origin story, in your first movie or first game, so that you can set that level for for the future you know iterations to build off of, and so that people have proper context for the story you're trying to tell. So it's a failure for sure, um, but I, or they just didn't know. <laughs> they didn't know where they wanted to go with it. I'm serious, man. I mean, that, yeah, sure. Like, that's possible. Here's yeah. a really, here's a real fucking cool world. Here's some fucking ugly fucking looking dudes we developed by stealing uh, Capcom's development uh, assets. <laughs> and here are some beefy buff boys with guns that can chainsaw shit. And chainsaws are awesome, by the way. I love it when you chainsaw people. And let's throw these games and let them do shit. And uh, there's there's kind of a plot here, but uh we'll get to it yeah also quick side note about that the the chainsaw guns they actually blazinski had to fight to keep that in the game by the way they almost had that pulled out and uh bill gates himself actually came came to blazinski and told him how fucking awesome the chains the chainsaw guns were so yeah because 
Bill Gates is a nerd. Of course he loves it. <laughs> no, there was Why I don't, Bill I don't Gates remember love it. I don't remember the name, but at the time there was another like higher up at Microsoft who was lobbying very, very hard to get the chainsaw guns removed because he thought it was too violent. Shut up, you fucking suit. <laughs> like what the fuck, dude? Like, the, yeah, of course, the guy who owns Microsoft is going to be cool with it. He developed shit out of a garage. He was like living on the edge, probably getting stoned. Who knows? Probably won't tell anyone if he was. He wasn't. Allegedly. Probably does now. I don't know. I have no yeah. idea. But yeah. he probably was. He probably like, dude, like that chainsaw portion. I was really hoping they'd get that graphic in Doom. And now they do do that in Doom. That's true. I don't know. Was that the first game where you could like chainsaw people up like that very close? Mm, I mean, no, the original Doom had an actual chainsaw. Right, but, like, you know what I mean. Like, that graphically. Because, yeah, I know Doom had a chainsaw, and you could do that with a chainsaw. But, like, that kind of QTE where you walked up and it would engage in this automatic action where you just chop people in half like that. Yeah, with yeah, with those, like, finisher animations, I think, I I mean, I'm kind of talking a little bit out of my ass, but from what I know, I think that was probably one of the first games to, like, like really a, do that. So It's like a Mortal Kombat fatality. A little bit, yeah. And actually, initially in the multiplayer, the only way that you could gain um, a, a a fallen player's like items uh, would be to kill them with a finisher only. So they ended up changing that, but that was the original intention. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. I, I think overall, like I said, the the story, the plot of the Gears universe gets better once you get further into the series. Um, it gets way more fleshed out. I think that the first game had a lot going for it, but I think it didn't capitalize on a lot of that. And I think at least on that point, I think you and I agree. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's not like the, the plot is really essential to having a good time with this game either. No, but no, if you if you're invested in it, because I do think that has become commonplace today, if you're invested in having a plot with your shooter uh, you're going to be somewhat disappointed. But if you like to turn your mind off and enjoy it from that perspective, that's fine. Which leads me to my question, Shane. Yes. Do you think this game has held up in today's world? Um, yeah. I mean, I think so. I mean, I do still hold to my my belief that it's a little bit too long for its own good. But uh, if you can get past that like last quarter of the game or so where you start to get a little bit of fatigue from the mechanics... Um, yeah, no, I, I, I still think it holds up really well. I mean, there's a reason that it set the bar for a whole generation of, of third person shooters. Like it, it does what it set out to do extremely well. And especially with like the HD remaster collection that they released a number of years later, um, I'd probably recommend just grabbing that. Although even if you go back and play the original, I still think it looks pretty damn good even today. So I think so too. So yeah, no, I, I would totally if you're even remotely interested in sci-fi or shooters or or anything of that, I, you know, genre, I I would absolutely recommend at least playing the first game. I, I kind of feel the same way. I do think the game is held up. And, and it's one of those things. So it's is the question is this like for me, the question is, was this the game that defined that generation or was that like Call of Duty? Mm hmm. There, there's two games, I think, to find the generation if you're a PlayStation 3, Xbox 360 player. Because for Wii U, not Wii U, I'm sorry. For the Wii, it was Wii Sports, right? Yeah. But that absolutely. didn't necessarily define the generation. This game defined a generation of games when it comes to establishing kind of the brown, gritty, kind of depressing atmosphere that was very endemic of the games at the time. It established that. The gameplay that it had was very synonymous with the more AAA, high-profile games of the era. And like most defining uh, generation-defining games, yes, it has held up. Are there some flaws with it? Absolutely. Is it a little too long? Probably. Was it back then? No. Uh, can you have a good time and not, not care too much, just go and kill shit and enjoy the ultra-violence? And switch your mind off for a bit? Yeah. And that's why games like Quake and Unreal and Doom, that's why they persevere. That's why they carry on and they continue to be loved by an audience. Because at the end of the day, it's all about slaughtering people and having a good time while you're doing it in a video game. <laughs> and that that's what it boils down to. Yeah, and as long as you true. can do that effectively, efficiently, and have a good time doing it, it, it holds up. And that's why Gears of War still holds up today. Like you said, if you can play the enhanced version... Uh, the the 
definitive edition or whatever the fuck it's called, the, the one that was released a couple years ago, go with that one. But uh, it still looks good on the 360, still plays well on the 360 controller, and you can't go wrong. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the big like bonus from that enhanced edition or whatever is the uh, the new cutscenes. Um, cause if you do a comparison between the original releases cutscenes and the enhanced one, they, they are, they're definitely better. Like they're more cinematic and obviously they look better. So it, between the two, yeah, I, I'd probably say try to pick up that version if you can. I mean, it also might arguably be easier to get at this point for all I know. Well, I'd probably say the 360 one is the easiest to get cause it probably costs like $5. I mean, and sure. It's just, why would you, if, if you don't have a 360 already, there's yeah just well i mean no one has an xbox one either uh <laughs> wow <laughs> so, so sick late stage life cycle console burn uh, um yeah if it's yeah get it if you have a pc and if you're listening to us you probably do and your pc is probably good enough even today to run the original gears of war on windows you uh, yeah give it a shot yeah absolutely uh, so, uh, with all of that said, uh, real quick, just a quick plug for our, uh, Sunday streams on Twitch. We are there just about every Sunday night at 9 PM Eastern time. So, uh, please feel free to jump in. We're usually there for at least an hour or two, and we are playing some retro game or another, usually, uh, related to whatever our most recent episode was, or in a most recent case, uh, related to the holiday. So since Easter had just come and gone, we were, uh, we were playing, uh, jumping flash for the the PSX because you know it has a rabbit in it, and that was as close who, as I could get to Easter. And who doesn't like rabbits? Because they remind us of fucking. <laughs> Absolutely. And so on that note, uh, w- with all of that said, until next time, play with your chainsaw rib joysticks. Mm-hmm.